So we're pleased to have with us today three engaging presenters. We have Mark Hewitt. He is a program director at Emissions Reduction Alberta, which is also known as ERA, uh, an Alberta-based not-for-profit corporation with a mandate to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and grow Alberta's economy by accelerating the development and adoption of innovation technology solutions. Mark is a professional engineer with extensive experience designing and delivering energy efficiency and renewable energy programs to the commercial and industrial sectors in Alberta. He previously led the solar commercial and industrial portfolio at Energy Efficiency Alberta. Alongside an experienced team at the ERA, Mark will be leading the Energy Savings for Business program, which recently opened to applications and which we're learning more about today. So welcome, Mark. Thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Next up, we're going to be hearing from Alison Mostowich. Alison is an experienced engagement and outreach professional in the areas of energy efficiency, conventional resources, regulatory environments, and small business startups. She has led teams and managed programs at the Energy Resources Conservation Board, Alberta Energy Regulator, Energy Efficiency Alberta, and now with Emissions Reduction Alberta. Her experience working with multiple levels of government, multiple leadership levels in organizations and businesses throughout the province has built Allison's strong focus on an inclusive and practical approach to decision making and implementation. Allison holds a Bachelor of Management from the University of Lethbridge and a Master's of Science in Behavioral Science from the London School of Economics. Welcome, Allison. Thanks for joining us. And last but not least, I would like to welcome Abhishek Chakraborty. Uh, he has a background in engineering and business. He has extensive experience in municipal economic development and energy transition programming and corporate strategy business planning. Over the past eight years, Abhishek has designed, managed and reported on important business retention and expansion programs and an update to the city's community energy transition strategy. Sorry, I think I skipped a line there. I'm going to just go back again. His current role as a senior environmental project manager focuses on Edmonton's commercial energy transition programs and an update to the city's community energy transition strategy. There we go. He works closely with Edmonton's business leaders as well as internal and external stakeholders to develop and deliver new municipal commercial energy transition programs, explore environmental policy instruments, and create new municipal funding and reporting solutions to implement energy transition actions. Welcome Abhishek and thank you all for joining us today. Thank now you. I'm going to turn the mic over to Mark to begin our presentations and I'll see you all again in a short time uh, for the Q&A. Today we're going to give you a quick introduction to ERA and the ESB program. We're definitely not going to cover everything in the time we have but we are hoping to cover some of the basics um, around program eligibility, a little bit about the measures and incentive levels, um, and some of the basics around how to apply. Since we can't cover everything in this short time, we're also going to talk about some of the resources uh, that might be helpful, and we'll save a lot of time for questions and answers as well at the end. Before we dive into the program details, I wanted to share just a little bit of background about Emissions Reductions Alberta, or ERA as we call it. ERA is an Alberta-based not-for-profit corporation with a mandate to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to grow Alberta's economy by accelerating the development and adoption of innovative technology solutions. Since 2009, ERA has invested the proceeds of the carbon price, uh, or the tier fund as we call it now, paid by large final emitters. Our investments help innovators develop and demonstrate GHG reducing technologies, the lower cost, improve competitiveness, and accelerate Alberta's transformation towards decarbonization. Given ERA's history of focusing on innovative technology commercialization, particularly through big funding competitions, it's likely that uh, many of you out there, uh, for many of you, this is a relatively new organization. Um, but with our latest program, Energy Savings for Business, we're very excited to be a part of ERA's expanding mandate. Uh, Energy Savings for Business, or ESB, is somewhat of a new program style for ERA. Uh, it might be familiar to many of you if you participated or were familiar with Energy Efficiency Alberta style of programs. Uh, but as I said, we're excited to, to now have that style within ERA 
as it really helps to drive increased market uptake of proven commercial technologies and really opens the door to funding accessibilities for small and medium businesses. Energy savings for business will provide much needed economic stimulus to help get people back to work in these times. It's also streamlined, predictable, and easy to use, making it much easier for businesses of all types. This program offers a simplified application process, quicker turnaround times, and a pretty broad list of technologies. And most importantly, um, compared to some of VRA's competitive calls, this one has clear comprehensive information about the program eligibility, and it's on a first come first serve. I'll now hand it over to Elson, who will take you through some of the program uh, overview as well as some of the eligibility criteria. Thanks, Mark. Welcome, everybody. Uh, let's get to the details of the Energy Savings for Business program. So I know many of you have joined us on the line previously. Uh, we've hosted quite a few webinars over the last few weeks, so some of this content might be familiar to you. Uh, stick with us till the end. We've got some really important information about uh, stacking programs, especially ESB and uh, the VERA program from the City of Edmonton. Um, so November 2nd, we announced up to $55 million in funding from the provincial and federal governments to support cost saving and emissions reducing projects in Alberta. This funding is sourced from a combination of sources. Um, it's sourced from the Technology Innovation and Emissions Reduction or TIER Fund, like Mark was mentioning, as well as the Low Carbon Economy Leadership Fund. This program is aimed at small and medium scale industrial and commercial facilities in the province, though it is open to larger businesses as well. We are hoping to get these funds driving new investments as soon as possible. We designed the Energy Savings for Business program with four core purposes in mind. Energy Savings for Business will result in job creation and the preservation of jobs, more competitive Alberta businesses, an economic boost, and support our province's economic recovery. Very important right now. And we're going to do this while supporting technologies and projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address Alberta's longer term sustainability goals. Looking at the numbers, Alberta has over 160,000 small and medium sized enterprises, and we're hoping to reach thousands with this program. As the ESB program rolls out, we're anticipating achieving the following results. Over 1,400 local jobs will be supported as participating projects rely on local contractors and a skilled workforce. This means direct jobs such as electricians, HVAC technicians, plumbing and heating experts, equipment distributors, lighting installers, product suppliers, engineers, so forth. Provincial investment will be leveraged more than five times with other public and private investment, creating $300 million in GDP impacts and economic activity. And over their lifetime, projects supported through the program are expected to reduce GHG emissions by 1.1 million tons of CO2 and to generate $183 million in energy savings. So what does that mean for your business? On a per capita basis, energy savings for business is currently the largest program of its kind in North America. Based on early engagement and surveys, which some of you may have taken, we have heard from businesses that they are eager to, eager to participate in order to help reduce their utility bills. Learning from previous programs with similar scope, we have adapted the program to be more streamlined. We know time is money to Alberta businesses and are committed to fast turnaround times. For standard applications, this can be as quick as two days. The program has been designed to reflect the realities of the pandemic. Incentive payments will be made electronically and all program materials are available in digital downloadable format that can easily be printed by contractors or participants. We've also expanded the measures list to include categories that have not previously been offered in efficiency programming, such as geothermal and compressed air. We have also made sure to include measures that are accessible to all businesses, like ceiling and wall insulation, refrigerated case covers, more efficient motors, lighting systems, and high efficiency windows. At the end of the day, we'll have over 300 measures to offer in this program. The Energy Savings for Business program opened to applications February 1st for projects with eligible measures that incurred expenses on or after November 2nd, 2020. Projects that incurred expenses between November 2nd, 2020 and February 1st, 2021 must submit their applications 
one month after the measures that they're interested in have gone live. So that's actually a change than we've previously talked about. Um, we're still rolling measures out. And originally we had said March 1st, but we know that's not reasonable for measures that are rolling out closer to the end of February. So it'll be a rolling one month date from the measures that you're interested in. Some relevant incentive limits to be aware of include a $250,000 per project and $500,000 limit per parent company. There is also a minimum incentive spend of $1,000 or sorry, an incentive amount of $1,000, which means that total projects costs will need to be at least $2,000, depending on the measure type in order to be eligible. The Energy Savings for Business program has been designed to be open to as many business types as possible. Simply put, if you're a business and you own your building, you are likely eligible. Um, in our previous webinars, we've had quite a few questions about different eligibility types. Some requests for clarity came up around farm, faith-based, and Indigenous owned businesses. This program is designed to support a broad range of Alberta businesses and nonprofits. If you can answer yes to all of the following questions, you are eligible. Are you a business or nonprofit in Alberta, excluding the ineligible facility types? Are you the owner of that facility? If you lease your facility, are you authorized to complete upgrades or retrofits? Is the facility used for commercial or industrial business primarily? Does it have a non-residential electricity account? That's a key one. Does your facility have an Alberta address? And is the facility an existing building? Has it been in operation for at least one year? So you'll notice up in the corner, there's a box. These are our ineligible facility types. And those include residences, government owned facilities, publicly funded institutions, including if you receive 50% or more of your funding from a public authority, industrial businesses or facilities classified as large emitters or opted into the tier regulation, and new construction. So that little star at the end of new construction is the, the exemption. Um, solar PV, geothermal, and CHP are exceptions to the new construction rule and are actually eligible. So what about contractors? Contractors, including product and service providers, are the backbone of any successful energy efficiency program. Participants will rely on skilled contractors to plan and design systems, select appropriate technologies, and install high quality projects. In many cases, contractors will often manage applications for participants as well. To help ensure the program's success, we do require that all participants use eligible contractors as the primary contractor for their projects. To become an eligible contractor, it's easy. You just have to register on our portal, agree to a code of conduct, and the program's terms and conditions. I'm gonna pass it to Mark to go through the eligible measures now. Great, thank you, Allison. Uh, so as Allison mentioned, we did design this program to be as broad as, and accessible as possible by adding a whole bunch of different technologies. And um, we don't want to go through all of them today, but this slide sort of shows the, the high level measure categories. So on February 1st, when we launched, our launch included a whole range of measures um, spanning compressed air, solar PV, lighting systems and controls, motors and drives, which includes kind of a whole bunch of different energy efficient motors and variable frequency drives, uh, combined heat and power, a wide range of refrigeration technologies and geothermal. And uh, for those who are part of the launch webinar, we, we mentioned a whole bunch of other things are coming soon. So we, we are continuing to work on making even more measures out there. Um, HVAC, water heating, process heating should all be coming out pretty soon, um, probably in the next week or two. And then food services, uh, sorry, actually in building envelopes as well. Food services and um, actually probably a collection of other measures we got some feedback from folks on will be coming out over the coming month or so. So the best is to, if you haven't already signed up uh, for notifications, go onto our website and sign up and you'll be uh, part of the mailing list for any future updates on measures that come out. The other is uh, I'll definitely refer you to the measure list, which is a comprehensive guide of all the measures. And it goes through the different incentive levels, what the requirements are for each one um, and the different, uh, the whole range of different sizes and equipment configurations. My next slide actually shows an example from the measure list, just because it 
with, uh, you know, as Allison said, we're getting upwards of 300 measures by the time it's complete. So it can be a bit overwhelming to open that up. So this slide is really just a bit of a guide as to what to expect when you open it. So at the top, um, you'll see the measure category uh, on the top of each major section. And each measure under, for example, motors and drives will be listed sub subsequently. The bold area below shows the actual measure name. And so those are, when we say measure, what we really mean is technology type. So a category might be motors and drives and a specific one might be uh, variable frequency drives or high efficiency motors or in other categories, it might be a furnace or something of that sort or furnaces of a specific size. Below that, there'll be a list of bullets and that is a summary of the really the key requirements for that technology to be eligible. Um, some of this is covered in the participant terms and conditions. So this is really intended to work in combination. Um, obviously there's a broad range of eligibility criteria that technologies have to meet. The measure list covers the ones specific uh, to the measure. For example, uh, in this case, you know, the horsepower must be between one and 100 for this particular measure. Below that, um, you know, we have the actual code that you'll see uh, in the software system. And more importantly, on the far right side, there's three pieces of information I just want to bring folks' attention to. So one is the incentive value per measure. So the energy savings for business, we tried to structure it to be easy for our folks to understand what to expect. And so each measure has a fixed incentive um, based on some sort of constant unit. So in this case, it's per horsepower for motor. That might change, it might be per fixture or it might be per megawatt or kilowatt. Uh, it depends on each measure, but that amount, the incentive value tells you what you should expect as sort of the maximum incentive. So in this case, uh, $125 per horsepower of the motor. The other is the incentive cap. So each measure has a specific percent cap. Um, that is based on the total eligible expenses. So when you complete a project, you'll get basically the lesser of 125 or 50% in this case of eligible costs. And uh, most measures are at 50%. Things like lighting, solar, CHP uh, will have a lower number. They're at 25%. So with today's audience, um, I don't wanna go through the whole measure list, but I did wanna highlight uh, a couple that we thought might be of interest. So starting here, um, looking at on-site generation, we do have two technologies that can provide power on-site. And so it's a little bit different where energy efficiency helps you save money. On-site power actually helps you offset it by generating uh, electricity locally, or in CHP's case, heat and electricity at the same time. For solar, we have two different incentive levels, uh, one for smaller systems of 65 cents per watt, up to 25% of eligible costs. And for larger systems, uh, systems basically bigger than 15 kilowatts and up to two megawatts, uh, the incentive is 50 cents per watt. CHP similarly has two different incentive structures, uh, but not based on size, actually based on efficiency. So there's sort of your standard CHP system uh, with a bit lower efficiency gets $400 per kilowatt and the really high efficient CHPs get a bit more. And again, both of those are capped at 25%. Um, I wanted to cover a few additional details. So um, both CHP and solar, as well as geothermal, are basically the three complex measures in our program. Um, so you'll see in the terms and conditions, there's a few extra requirements for all of those. I won't go into CHP and geothermal today. Uh, we do have webinars on both those subjects. But for solar, uh, just given the audience, I wanted to talk through some of the extra requirements that apply, just so folks are aware. So first and foremost, um, the one exception that Allison already mentioned is you can do solar PV on new construction. So that's, uh, that is an exception. Uh, new buildings are allowed. The other is we are, uh, we do accept expansions to systems. We know some folks might already have solar in place, but with this program want to grow their system. Um, that you have to note it in the application, but it's, it is allowed. The other specific requirements, it does have to be microgen compliant. Um, so that does mean grid connected and compliant with the regulation. We have some extra requirements for the contractors. They must be either a member of Solar Alberta, our hosts today, the CANRIA, or the ECA, the Electrical Contractors Association. 
finally, the other one I wanted to bring attention to is just that the, the solar PV must meet a minimum of 75% of performance uh, relative to the optimal for an area. And that's really just so that we know we're giving incentives to high performing projects. It is pretty flexible to different rooftop configurations and uh, ground mounts. But that is a check that we'll be looking for as projects get pre-approved. So last, before I hand it off, I just wanted to talk uh, quickly about some of the basic application processes. Um, again, I'll go through it pretty quick. I'm really just trying to give you a bit of an overview. But there's essentially five steps. The first step is for the participant and the contractors to register. It's just basic information about who you are. The second is to actually start a project. So that's the pre-approval process. Um, this is initiated by a participant wanting to start a project. And the first step is to identify an eligible contractor. And at that point, the contractor can actually help if desired to complete the rest of the detailed application. And when it's ready, the participant submits it and it will then be reviewed by our team and the participant will be notified uh, if and when it's pre-approved. And at that point, I just wanted to note the program is first come first serve, but it's based after it's pre-approved. So we really encourage folks not to submit incomplete applications, submitting something before it's ready does not speed anything up if it actually slows it down and it doesn't help you get any spots faster. So please do submit completed applications. The third step is after pre-approved, participants can go ahead and actually install the project, purchase the equipment, and we generally give six months uh, as a time limit. Now I do wanna raise awareness that for solar, because it is a more complicated project, uh, solar CHP and geothermal can can apply for an exception to the six month rule and get an extension. Those are reviewed on a case by case basis. So just contact us if that's the case. Once the project is complete, uh, we get to the post project approval. So basically folks submit all the documentation that's required to help uh, us verify that you did the project as you said, that will be reviewed and you'll be notified when you're approved. At that time, uh, we basically just ask for bank information and who the money should go to, we verify it and incentives are paid within four to six weeks. So with that, I will hand it back to Allison to talk about some of our other resources. Hmm. So as Mark mentioned, this is really just meant to be an overview of the program. Um, I'm sure there's lots of in-depth questions that everybody has. Uh, there are quite a few documents on our website. Our website is absolutely the, the source of truth. So you can find our website at eralberta.ca forward slash ESV. And right now we just have a list of, uh, or on the slide, you'll just see a list of some of the resources that we currently have. Um, the participant terms and conditions, measures list and contractor code of conduct are up. Uh, in the few, in the coming weeks, we're hoping to add a program guidebook, which will be um, absolutely essential and uh, a companion to the, the participant terms and conditions. It's a little, little bit more plain language, a little bit easier to get through. Um, we're going to have application checklists for specific measures, and those are complements to the measure-specific webinars we're also hosting. Um, and we'll have an application guide, so that will take you through screenshots of how to actually apply for specific measures. So additional resources that we've recently added are, um, oops, sorry, our webinars. Um, we've posted the webinars that we've already hosted, so they're there for posterity. You can access those anytime. We've got the program brochure, which is a one pager that you can use for clients or even within your own organization if you're interested in accessing measures. And we've also got a really robust list of FAQs to start with. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we just wanted to give you a bit of a quick overview of the progress to date. Um, we're really pleased with how much interest we've seen in the program. It's been open since February 1st, like we mentioned. So we've already got 108 applications submitted for approval. Um, you can see we've got over 600 contractor accounts registered, over 600 registered participants. And like I mentioned, we do have webinars posted. Um, this week, we actually hosted two webinars already. So we hosted the Motors and Drives webinars on February 16th. February 17th, we had the Solar PV webinar. So if you weren't able to catch that one, please go to our website. We've got it posted, or we will have it posted there shortly. And then today at two o'clock, we're hosting the lighting systems and control measures. Um, that's, that'll be available on our website. So please register if you have an interest in that. And again, if you missed anything, it will be on the website. We've got a really robust library of resources available there. So finally, our contact information. Um, so like I said, the website is the source of truth. 
um, we've got an email and a phone that is dedicated to this program. So if you do have any questions or can't find anything on the website, please do reach out. We also have a chat function available on the website and in the program portal. Um, we've got a LinkedIn account and we've got a Twitter account. So if you're looking for updates on the program, you can stay updated that way. And Mark already mentioned, but the best way to get updates is to sign up for updates on the website. Those are absolutely the most immediate updates that you can get. So with that, I will hand it to Abhishek from the City of Edmonton to go through the Barra program. Thanks, Alison. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to talk about uh, the City of Edmonton's Building Energy Retrofit Accelerator Program, also called Barra, uh, here today. Uh, it is a program that can be stacked with uh, the energy emission reduction Alberta's uh, program. So uh, I, I, for today, I'll be the topics that I'll be covering over the next ten minutes will include uh, the eligibility uh, requirements for uh, applicants for Bera. I'll also uh, talk a bit about the measures list and. Uh, also the application process and we'll end, uh, end up talking a bit about the commercial programming at the city of Edmonton, uh, because one of the program is required uh, and the participation in one of the program called uh, building energy benchmarking is required for uh, an applicant to be eligible for VERA. So in terms of the uh, eligibility requirements for VERA, uh, I wanted to first talk a bit about the uh, objectives that we are trying to achieve uh, through the Vera program at the city of Edmonton. I, uh, for most of the commercial and the residential programs that uh, the city of Edmonton has uh, implemented, uh, our uh, main objectives are to encourage uh, deep green retrofits. By that, I mean um, as much uh, greenhouse gas reduction as can be achieved uh, realistically from uh, the solutions that are supported through a city of Edmonton rebate program. Aside from that, we also uh, use this as a medium, uh, use all our commercial and residential programs as a medium for uh, strengthening our existing relationships with the uh, businesses, uh, local businesses and uh, organizations within uh, Edmonton. And finally, we hope to achieve um, uh, market transformation through all our uh, programming. And we also hope that uh, if and when there are any sorts of, sort of regulations uh, that come into play, Edmonton businesses are ready to capture and seize those opportunities. So we are proactively helping businesses prepare for uh, the future energy transition within uh, Edmonton. And now get into the program eligibility part for uh, BERA. Uh, so some of the program eligibility part, uh, el eligibility requirements are similar to the uh, emission uh, reduction Alberta's program. So for us, the building type uh, uh, has to be a commercial building or an institutional building uh, within uh, or a multi-family residential building, the common areas only, and light industrial buildings within uh, the city of Edmonton's municipal boundaries. Uh, one of the other requirements that is a bit unique to Vera and uh, is the requirement for the building size to be greater than 10,000 square feet uh, for now. Uh, and uh, the last requirement, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation is that uh, the building also, like anyone applying for Vera also needs to register their building for the building energy benchmarking program. Uh, offered through the city of Edmonton. Uh, in terms of uh, the requirements uh, for uh, applying for the program, all the eligibility requirement as well as the application requirement are available on the city of Edmonton's website. So I would encourage uh, all of you to go and visit the city of Edmonton's website uh, at your own leisure to uh, see uh, what exactly do you need to apply for the programs. But overall, there is an online application that needs to be filled out. And then we also require a proof of registration in the building energy uh, uh, benchmarking program uh, for the city of Edmonton. And uh, tenants are also eligible to apply for the, uh, for the BERA program. Uh, we also would require a copy of uh, your utility bill or anything else that proves uh, uh, that you are a functioning business or, or an organization within the municipal boundaries of Edmonton. And then we also require a sign uh, terms and conditions document from you. And once you complete the uh, installation, we would need a copy of the invoice uh, along with uh, the details of what the installation, uh, what, what kind of installation has occurred. I'll uh, now get a 
fit into the rebate maximum and caps. Um, and so for most of the measures, uh, uh, the eligible rebate can be up to 50% of the equipment on the labor cost. Uh, aside from that, uh, there is a minimum uh, rebate per application amount uh, that is uh, uh, required for uh, participation in the bearer program and which is $1,000. Uh, aside from that, the maximum rebate per building per project per program year is uh, seventy-five thousand dollars. If you uh, if you don't uh, uh, include a heat pump uh, in your uh, installation, if you uh, decide to install a heat pump, it can go to a maximum of one hundred and twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. Tenants do not count towards the building cap, but a maximum rebate per company per program year is $150,000 per year. Uh, so you cannot exceed that amount uh, for any given program year. And our program year usually uh, runs from uh, March, of, uh, uh, March of a year to uh, the next March. Uh, that is how the uh, program cycle works for us. So just uh, for you folks to know. In terms of bonuses, one of the unique features that we offer through Vera is an opportunity to bundle. As I mentioned during the beginning of my presentation that we uh, do encourage uh, deep green retrofits. So bundling bonuses are offered for deeper green retrofits uh, between five to 10% on top of uh, what uh, you can, your uh, rebate is eligible for. So for instance, if you install uh, more than two measures at any given point of time, you may be eligible for a 5% uh, bonus on uh, uh, top of what you're being offered uh, and it can go up to a maximum of 10% for anything greater than two uh, or more measures. Uh, there is also a certificate, energy certification bonus that's offered through the program which can go up to 50% of the cost of the application fee or uh, $10,000 whichever is uh, uh, more and then this can also constitute to a 5% additional bonus on top of the bundling bonus for uh, eligible and participating buildings. Uh, I'm not going to get into the details of the kind of certification uh, that is allowed under uh, BERA, but uh, it's for you to see on the presentation. Like these are some of the certifications that can make you eligible for the certification bonus. I now get into the eligible measures uh, part of the presentation. And uh, I just quickly talk about the measure inclusion process. So during the design of the program, the way we decided on the type of measures to be included was on the ability of a measure uh, to meet the lifetime carbon abatement threshold. And then also the measure being compatible with uh, deeper green retrofits and then an industry need based on the stakeholder consultations we had for a rebate uh, for encouraging a particular type of measure. Uh, on your right, you also see uh, the rationale behind one of the measures, which is heat pump on uh, how that measure was included and what exactly was the thought process be behind including, including that measure in uh, uh, BERA. Uh, I'll not get into a lot of detail, including a heat pump. Uh, again, it's for uh, you to see on the uh, slide in front of you. In terms of percentages, as I mentioned, most of the measures that we have uh, can get you up to 50% uh, of your cost back uh, uh, for uh, the installation. And this slide generally shows you what are the averages that you can expect to get from um, applying through the BERA program for a particular measure that you may have, starting from lighting to HVAC to controls or the building on envelope or uh, certification. I'll uh, quickly now talk about the application process. So there are two ways for uh, applicants to apply for BERA. One is the pre-approval application process, which is the more uh, 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 preferred uh, mechanism for us, uh, for uh, anyone to apply for BERA. Uh, and the reason why we say so is because this ensures that there would be a committed fund available for your installation once you complete the installation. And it also provides uh, the applicant a slightly longer timeline to actually make the uh, actual install installation, which, uh, and it gives them approximately nine months from the pre-approval of their application to complete the approval and be able to submit the invoices. Uh, there is another option available for applicants to bear, and that is the post-installation. 
Uh, so any installation that has happened uh, occurred after June 3rd of 2021 is, uh, 2020, sorry, but is eligible for the uh, post-installation rebate. But the only catch to this is that uh, an invoice needs to be submitted within 30 days of the installation for approval. And it can take us up to a month to uh, review your application and uh, provide you with uh, uh, the rebate check in, in this case. I uh, quickly wanted to conclude my presentation by talking a bit more about the commercial programming at the city of Edmonton. So aside from the building energy retrofit uh, accelerator program, we have a couple of other programs that we offer through the uh, city of Edmonton's uh, commercial programming. Uh, one of the programs that I mentioned at the beginning is the building energy benchmarking program, which is an eligibility requirement for uh, participation in VERA. And uh, that program is, uh, that program requires a participant to uh, benchmark their building's uh, performance. Uh, by that, I mean the energy use performance, mostly natural gas and electricity use, uh, and compare it to other similar buildings in uh, the category uh, uh, that they are participating in. Aside from that, we also have more of an overall program called the Corporate Climate Leaders Program, which is an opportunity for local businesses within Edmonton to be able to participate and network with other like-minded businesses within Edmonton to uh, reduce their uh, GHG uh, footprint as well as uh, by managing it and by making the necessary changes. And then the kind of support that you're provided through the city of Edmonton to actually make those changes is through one of the programs that I just mentioned, Vera. And uh, there are other programs offered through the city of Edmonton as well on the commercial side, where the, which is the electric vehicle uh, charger rebate, where a business is eligible for up to $2,000 for a level two uh, EV charger. Finally, I wanted to conclude by uh, talking a bit about the building energy benchmarking program and getting into a bit more detail since this is required as an eligibility uh, for uh, Vera. And uh, the benefits that you uh, get out of the program is that your uh, building uh, is evaluated against uh, similar buildings. And we have over 400 uh, local buildings that participate in this program currently. And uh, what you get at the end of uh, your uh, participation at the program every year is a scorecard, which is uh, a sample of it is on your uh, on the right uh, right hand side of the slide, and uh, uh, it will basically tell you how you benchmark against uh, uh, other similar buildings and as well as national benchmarks. And what are the things that uh, what are the changes that you could possibly make to your building to reduce its energy use, and. Uh, one of the good things about this program is that uh, you are eligible for an audit rebate of up to $10,000 or 50% of the audit rebate cost uh, by participating in this program. And uh, since we use uh, Energy Star Portfolio Manager for uh, submitting the energy use information, uh, there is a seamless integration if you choose to get your building certified through BOMA Best or uh, LEED EBOM or LEED version 4. Uh, so those are some of the benefits of participation in uh, building energy benchmarking program. And now pass it over to uh, Alison and Mark to talk a bit about uh, the uh, stacking option between the two programs. Great, thank you so much. So as uh, many folks have expressed interest so far, we wanted to spend a bit of time talking about how the two programs together and um, since the city of Edmonton and Emissions Reductions Alberta really recognized the benefits of participating in both programs, we wanted to offer an approach that allows people to access both programs and to understand how the two work together. Um, so first, um, obviously it probably goes without saying this applies only to facilities within Edmonton city bounds. Um, projects outside of Edmonton won't be accessible to Bureau, so they'll proceed through ESB quite normally. And similarly, this applies only to measures that are in both programs. So folks can uh, complete projects with measures that are only in one of the programs, and that would basically just proceed under each respective program normally. And in each program, um, I believe there's going to be some sort of, like on our program, you basically have to check off and disclose other funding contributions. So if you're thinking of applying to ESB and BRA, and BRA 
uh, you would check off and disclose that you're considering an application or have an application in. And then how it works is basically that um, you can access incentives from the ESB program and then get a top up through Bira up to a maximum of 50%. And so what that means is uh, the ESB program will calculate what your incentive would be, um, whether that's limited by any caps or percentages and whatnot. And then basically when the project is complete, if that doesn't sum to 50% of the eligible costs, Bira will be able to top up the incentive, um, either up to the maximum of 50% or uh, any other Bira limit. So if, if you're approaching like a company or project limit, even with that, it might be slightly lower. Um, but that really allows sort of the optimal participation where we, we can enable both programs and we recognize there's value in both programs and uh, folks can get you know a bit of extra funding potentially depending on the circumstances. Um, our next slide actually walks through a bit of a visual demonstration of how you actually apply. And we've tried to simplify it. it it's it probably sounds more complicated than it is. So I'll do my best to make it sound nice and easy. But basically participants can register to either of the two programs uh, ultimately at any time. And the beginning of the res registration process is quite standard. So you basically apply to ESB or Bira or both at the same time and fill out the normal pre-approval applications other than checking off, yes, we're accessing another program. And behind the scenes, we'll be basically communicating so that uh, on our end, we're aware of when one project is in both and that there's a stacking opportunity. Um, when that's identified, Bira will contact folks to let them know that they are affected by incentive stacking and therefore the pre-approved amount might change. Obviously, if you're limited by 50%, one of the two programs, uh, in this case, Bureau, will issue the top up, which might be lower than the initial amount. And then after pre-approved in both programs, the project can actually get completed normally. So that's uh, sort of that middle step of both, both end. And then where the magic happens is once the project is complete, in order to keep the administrative side simple and clear, we've just decided basically when the project is fully processed and fully reviewed, the ESB program will pay first. So we'll conduct our final reviews of all incentives, uh, all the eligible costs and make sure that the project as completed gets paid. And then we'll provide that information to Bira who will then calculate the top up amount and issue that incentive payment after. So it, I guess it looks complicated, but really the only thing to note is one, make sure you do get pre-approval from both programs to you uh, will get a notification later that's indicating that you're affected by stacking. And then three, the Bira payment will be a bit later than normal because they're gonna be waiting on us. So don't get, uh, don't get mad at the good folks at Edmonton. It's probably that they're waiting to hear from us. And before I leave us today, uh, there were just a few other considerations. I think we've probably mentioned them a few times throughout, but this is just a little mini summary. So obviously the most important thing too is make sure you're eligible for both programs. Um, there are different conditions and this table is a little bit of a summary of them. That's definitely not exhaustive. But one example would be the size of the facility. Bira has a, a minimum facility size, ESB doesn't. So if you're a smaller facility, you'll only be able to use ESB, you won't be able to stack. If you're bigger, you might be able to stack. Um, there are different incentive amounts affected. Um, so ESB has 250K incentive maximum per project with Bureau, it's a bit different. So those may or may not affect your stacking, um, really depends on the size of your project. We have different parent company limits as well. And some of the eligibility is a little different. Um, so Bira will have, you know, for example, institutional facilities that won't be eligible in ESB. So um, again, it's really about looking at the criteria for both programs. And if you do match on both, then flagging that you're going to apply to both. Then um, the final is that uh, Bira does have a couple of bundling bonuses and other types of things. Those are calculated outside of the stacking since that's not part of ESB. And again, um, there are some really probably specific details about the measures, but in general, uh, if you're looking at lighting systems, refrigeration, VFDs, or HVAC, those are really the areas where they do overlap quite heavily. And so you might have an opportunity if you're doing one of those to access both programs. 
some of the industrial measures, let's say, are only under ESB. So with that, um, hopefully that makes sense to folks, and we'll maybe just stop there and leave time for questions. And again, thank you so much for having us. My, my first question is, if you're eligible for the BIRA program, and I, my understanding from listening to the presentation is that would be maybe up to 50%, why would you also apply for the ERA program? What would be the rationale for that? Yeah, I can take the first crack at that. So both programs have um, at least three different criteria for calculating the incentive. There's sort of that fixed stated amount, you know, $150 per fixture, and then it's up to 50% incentives. And then there's the project limits. So the the 50% is not always, right? So there might be situations where the $150 per unit is lower than 50%. The 50% is really more of a cap. So most of the time, there'll at least be some room to top up. The other would be, um, you might've hit your project limits. So it's possible you have a very big project and you've maxed out one of them mm -hmm. and you're not getting that full 50%. So yeah, that yeah. sounds a lot like when you, you know, if you and your spouse happen to both have a insurance plan and, you know, one of your plans tops out at 80% coverage, then the other one can kind of For be sure. the top. Yeah. It's a lot like that, hey, just... Uh, not the other, obviously. Yeah, the other is that product costs vary quite a bit. So when we make our menu of incentive levels, that's based on an average. So, you know, a higher product cost will max out the one while not being anywhere near the 50% as well. Okay, okay, thank you. I was also curious, uh, you know, hearing about what Edmonton has going on in this area, it made me wonder, are there other municipalities that are also stacking with you folks at ERA or is Edmonton alone in the province in, in doing this type of uh, additional programming? Yeah, so um, I don't wanna say other municipalities don't have programs. Edmonton was by far the biggest and the most proactive in reaching out. And really it was a discussion on recognizing that they have a very large and very similar program. Ours is a large and similar program how do we want these two to work together? Mm -hmm. There, There is no situation like that that's quite the same in any other municipality. Mm -hmm. um, so they're either different programs or they're quite a bit smaller where it just wasn't really a, a similar concern, I guess. Okay, and if any of the other municipalities adopt, you know, comprehensive programming like Edmonton has over the coming, you know, over the term of the ERA programming, uh, would you guys look at uh, developing a similar type of stacking scenario with those other municipalities? Absolutely. Um, I won't say that it'll necessarily look exactly the same. Um, I don't want to speak for Edmonton, but we really compared our program objectives and tried to land on a solution that worked for both of us. So mm -hmm. it's possible if, let's say, Calgary or someone else did something similar, they might have slightly different objectives. But okay. we would absolutely be interested in trying to find a way to make sure that the programs work together. Okay, thanks. And my questions are obviously very broad and overarching, but I know we're getting a lot of very specific questions here in the chat box. Uh, so I wonder if one of you would be willing to speak to uh, this question around, um, is there a funding limit for solar projects in particular? Um, and can that be applied to an apartment building? Uh, so that's a question. Uh, I think we were actually chatting about that in our preparation session, you know, the, the whole multifamily unit uh phenomenon and where that fits into the small and medium-sized business programming so if someone could take a stab at, at that solar question in particular uh, obviously we have a, a lot of solar enthusiasts on our in our programming yeah uh, how about i start but i can't probably answer the whole question myself um, so in esb solar is treated the same as every other measure. So the project and company limits um, are both 250K and 500,000 for all project types. Solar is not unique there. And um, we do allow the common spaces of multifamily residential buildings. So if solar PV is being put on the rooftop and is a shared utility, uh, that would be eligible, which I understand is the tiny narrow band of overlap we would have with the Edmonton solar program. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, it looks like another uh, 
the question popping up here, are there restrictions to ensure local contractors and tradespeople are used to keep all of the incentives here in Alberta? So um, what types of, you know, I think there's a lot of people saying buy local, you know, support local economy. So um, do you have any restrictions around that uh, this time? <clears throat> Yes, again, I'll, I'll just jump in from the ESB side. That That is a tricky thing to regulate. Um, so we do have eligible contractor standards and all of the projects do have to be located in Alberta. Uh, we don't have any specific geographical limits on where the products were purchased or where the service providers come from. They obviously do have to meet all of the Alberta qualified uh, requirements as well as permitting and everything like that. So we, we for sure obviously want to see the supporting jobs in Alberta, but being a, a country where lots of work is completed um, by folks from all across the country and products are purchased from all across the country, um, it's just not a, a limitation that we can put in place. Um, but obviously in reality, most of the time, the labor is being done quite locally. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is kind of trending the way we want it, but it's difficult for us to mandate it. Right. In terms of business ownership in particular, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Abhishek, I don't know is there... if you, yeah. So there is, it's my response would be similar to Mark's. Uh, we don't really have a restriction on where the contractor is from. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, as of now, but that's a good point. It's like, but yeah, going back to what just Mark, what Mark just said, I think, uh, it's a bit difficult to restrict uh, the contractor to a geographic location, uh, especially with uh, programs such as these. Yeah, and particularly with a municipally based program, I don't think you could really, uh, it'd be very challenging to, to restrict it to just Edmonton based companies. So uh, that would be, I could see that being challenging from an administrative perspective. Thank you for those answers. I have another um, broader question here. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know the city of Edmonton has their solar rebate program for homeowners for residential. Uh, and I'm wondering if the, that program is, you know, are there plans to uh, incorporate small and medium sized enterprises into uh, that program so that the solar component could be stacked in addition to the uh, energy efficiency component for Edmonton businesses, Abhishek? So right now, uh, I think uh, our programming usually, uh, like we love to expand it to smaller and medium sized businesses as well, uh, the solar panel installations, but uh, we are limited by the amount of funding available to us at a given point of time. Uh, and then I think uh, uh, the energy savings for business uh, program is a good opportunity for uh, local businesses to actually take advantage of the solar incentive that they are offering. And then they can always stack with the city of Edmonton's uh, program for the measures that uh, they can maximize the rebate on. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Let's see, I'm gonna grab another question here from the chat box. Are there, oh, we've got that one. We've covered a few here. We're making progress. Uh, we're just for those of you who are curious, our plan is to go to 115 today. And uh, so we do have 15 more minutes for questions if you wanna bump anything up in the chat box. Um, what incentives for a recycling business, or what incentives are there for a recycling business uh, to help uh, with energy efficiency? And I'm sorry that question just suddenly disappeared from the chat box right as I was reading it. So hopefully, you, I, I think Mark, you were interested in answering that question live. I might have been the one that killed it by accident, but oh. uh, <laughs> yeah, sorry. You were so keen it. on it. <laughs> um, so I think the question was asking about waste reduction specifically. And um, so at this time, all of our technology supported are either high efficiency technologies or on-site energy generation technologies. So we don't have anything specifically tackling a waste reduction. But if I sort of stretch the question a bit and say, what would a waste reduction facility be able to take advantage of? Um, they would for sure have likely motors, pumps, compressors, HVAC, lighting, and definitely the potential to put solar PV on. Um, so while we don't actually help reduce waste in that case, we'll hopefully help that business save money, which means that they can expand their business and save more waste. So it's a, it's a stretched answer, but hopefully that helps. No, I appreciate it. Thank you for that. Another broader question I have is, and I know 
I know when I sit in on, on all of these uh, technical sessions, as I sat in a bit on the solar PV one yesterday, uh, you know, some of the, the jargon and the, the technical details can be fairly overwhelming to, to those of us who don't have a technical background. And so I imagine for the, some of the business owners who are tuning in today or those people who are contemplating energy efficiency upgrades, I'm wondering, you know, can you explain in a little bit more detail how the contractors that they're partnering with can really ease that process uh, for moving into the energy uh, efficiency zone? You know, how can those contractors support them and help them understand that jargon? And to what degree do they need to even know all of that, right? Like, so if we're talking solar, you know, it, does a business owner have to know the, the tilt of their roof and the optimal angle for their position in the country before they apply to, to the, uh, you know, to the ERA program or can the uh, contractors sort of help them along with that? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll start, but maybe Allison can jump in, so, or Abhishek as well. Uh, we did try to structure the program so that the participant can do as much or as little as they want. Um, just recognizing there's some participants who are super keen and really want to control the application process, and um, they definitely can proceed with completing the application themselves. They do have to highlight which contractor they're working with, but they can fill out all the paper, well, paperwork, virtual paperwork themselves. For those um, in the history, those that many don't want to do that, they can really do as little as possible. So there are some steps the participant has to do. They have to fill out uh, the registration, which is you know, their name, number, contact info, as well as they have to initiate a project. And we do that because we don't want contractors starting projects without talking to their clients. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, they can then hand it over to the contractor who can actually fill out all the details of the application. And then the participant basically signs off and hits submit. So in that sense, um, you can really leave it up to, you know, if it's solar, the solar installer. Um, you know, we would obviously highly encourage some level of engagement. You'll get more out of your project, the more that you can understand a bit about it. Many solar installers are really good at walking folks through what, what the project is, what the difference of tilt and orientation are. But for sure, if you want to uh, work with someone who just can take care of all of that, that is definitely an option as well. And, um, you know, so at each stage of the application, they can basically just check off to like hand it over to the contractor to complete. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll add something to that, Heather. Thanks. Uh, kind of on the flip side, if there are larger organizations that have qualified contractors within the organization, they're actually welcome to assign their staff as contractors. You still have to assign a contractor, but they can assign internal folks. And so if you do have the qualified individuals to complete the project in-house, you're welcome to do that yourself. Okay, yeah, that's helpful information because I know there were a lot of contractors on the call as well today. So thank you for that. This is another uh, broader question I have, which is uh, with stacking available in Edmonton, I know ultimately your goals at ERA and at the city of Edmonton are to see some greenhouse gas reductions. Like that's, that's one of the main drivers for these programs is, you know, we're talking about climate change here. We're talking about reducing greenhouse gases in Alberta. And, and we have these programs available to help us meet those objectives, those, those broader objectives. Are you concerned at all that with the stacking programs available that we're actually going to limit the number of greenhouse gases that we reduce in the atmosphere and how, you know could you t elaborate a little bit on that sort of um, program efficiency question around you know does stacking reduce the impact of your programs yeah absolutely i'm happy to comment on that and uh, edmonton's welcome to jump in too so it, it is concerned um obviously if two people are giving incentives to the same project to go forward the efficiency goes down and that is a large part of why we have it limited at 50%. And as you sort of commented, most of our program measures are already limited at 50%. And for sure, that's not what the average will be. Uh, but we're, I guess we designed it where we're comfortable with the results that we'll get at that level. Um, the other half of it, though, is that GHGs only occur if projects go forward. So uh, while we all individually try to design our programs to get the right level of uptake to hit our objectives, um, 
having a municipality come in with their own funding to help reduce the burden on the participant from their side, um, that's actually just a, a great use of funds locally. Um, now, for anyone who's actually really nerdy and really worried about this, we are very careful in calculating the savings and not reporting them twice. So we, we are working behind the scenes with Edmonton so that um, when we actually report up the effects of the programs, we're not double counting anything along the way, which is also very important. But uh, yeah, ultimately, um, the participant is always paying the other portion of the program. And if municipalities want to step up and help uh, their local businesses, um, it's not really on us to stop them. It was more that we wanted to make sure that, you know, we were hitting both program objectives. Absolutely. No, I appreciate that. Anything you want to add there, Abhishek? Uh, no, I think uh, Mark has summarized it pretty well. So, uh, I, and I think this is the first time we are doing something like this with uh, a provincial program. So we uh, are still waiting to see the results of uh, how, uh, uh, what kind of a GHG reduction would we be seeing with uh, combined projects in the program? But there is one thing for uh, the audience to uh, keep in mind when they apply for these programs. Uh, emission reductions, Alberta's program has a fixed timeline in terms of uh, the end date. Uh, our program goes on much further along the process. So as I mentioned, uh, the intention of the City of Edmonton's program is also to support market transformation uh, in the uh, medium to uh, long-term future. So that is, again, one of the motivations we have for any of the programming that we have. Right. Of course, I think we all dream that there will be some money magically appearing to extend the ERA's program. And uh, <laughs> I encourage all of our participants to uh, to try and uh, get our various levels of government to see some expansion on that because it is such an important program and I think the, the combined uh, the power to reduce greenhouse gases is significant so um, it's important, especially at this time and what I'm hearing from you is is really when we look at the small and medium sized businesses in Edmonton and around Alberta they're already hurting they're already struggling. Uh, it's going to be hard enough for them to scrape together these initial uh, investments. Ultimately, they'll see a wonderful return and it'll be beneficial for them in the long run, but the stacking component will certainly help them during these uh, harder economic times too. So I appreciate that. We're getting a few more specific questions and I'm gonna suggest that if it's a very specific project you have a question about, I think that that needs to go uh, to our panel participants for a much more detailed answer. So I'll, I'll I encourage our, our panel uh, participants to, make their email addresses and their contact information known again through the chat box or it's rather the Q&A um, for people to follow up with you after about some of these very specific project questions because there's some really exciting innovation I'm seeing in the Q&A um, projects that people are wanting to get off the ground um, and I think they would probably appreciate some individual follow-up. I know there was some uh, mention earlier, Allison, you mentioned the uh, solar webinar that you folks conducted yesterday. Um, you were saying that that is going to be available soon through ERA's uh, website. Uh, I see some folks are, are curious about that. Um, they basically need to sign up to get alerts through the ERA site, if I'm not mistaken, so that they can find out when those uh, webinars go live. Is that correct? Am I understanding correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it usually takes us a couple days to turn those webinars around. Um, so you can likely expect to see the solar webinar by end of week or early next week. Um, we post them regardless. So if you just keep checking back on the website, you'll be able to see when things have been posted. But if you want immediate notification that they have been posted, I would recommend that you sign up for updates through our website. Sounds good. And I think, you know, we're trying Solar Alberta our mighty, mighty staff contingent of two is trying very hard to also share a lot of the information that you guys are pushing out. So um, when that webinar goes live, we'll try and include it in our next uh, member update uh, that goes out as well. Uh, so, cause we are receiving your updates regularly and appreciate them. Uh, quick question here, mist weather solar PV are eligible for light industrial buildings. Are they, or are they not? Can anyone answer that question? Yes, so in ESB, um, we basically have participant eligibility, facility eligibility, and then if you meet both of those, you can do solar PV. So 
there is probably some exceptions with light industrial, like if you've opted into the tier regulation, for example, you'd not be eligible for that facility specifically. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, if, it, if it's a business or a nonprofit, industrial or not, yeah, you can definitely do solar PV. Yeah, so I think that you mentioned the tier is for those of you who missed the beginning of the presentation, a good chunk of the funding for this program is coming from the tier program. So therefore, if you are a participant in the tier program, <laughs> a contributor to that, you're not then a recipient of this funding, right? Those are the large mm -hmm. final emitters. And I understand a few uh, smaller folks have been opting into that as well. So I, I appreciate you mentioning that those would be exempt from this uh, provincial programming. Okay.